Goswami is a professor emeritus of physics at the University of Eugene, Oregon, where he has served since 1968. He is the pioneer of the new paradigm of science called Science Within Consciousness, an idea he explicated in his seminal book, The Self-Aware Universe, where he also solved the quantum measurement problem elucidating the famous observer effect. Dr. Goswami has written six other popular books based on his research on quantum physics and consciousness. His latest book is Creative Evolution. He was featured in the film What the Bleep Do We Know and its sequel Down the Rabbit Hole, as well as award-winning documentary The Quantum Activist. Welcome to Merlion Podcast, Dr. Goswami. It's so nice to have you with us today. It's good to be here. Oh, now... You mentioned growing up in India and playing as a child that you were in a flow state, a, a bliss state, and no separation from the environment. And how has this childhood influenced your work? Yes, I, I think uh, it, it really was uh, very wonderful uh, that I had the opportunity of having so much uh, spare time thanks to homeschooling. Um, and, of course, uh, thanks to the fruit orchard that my parents had um, behind their house. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just, I just remember uh, spending hours on uh, into the world of imagination and such wholeness that I would be filled with uh, joy and delight uh, practically every day. Um, I don't really directly know how that contributed uh, to my later development. I do know this, mm -hmm. that um, I always uh, look forward to having these encounters with the divine, a kind of a flow experience, and part of my motivation towards creative work came from that. Yes. Although, you know, when I was doing um, really routine uh, scientific work uh, as you know, I started as a materialist, and um, that never really gelled very well, although I achieved uh, much of academic success in a sense, but not really a great amount of success in doing really creative, innovative problems. That is the lot of many academics today. You yeah. know, we do secondary problems in most of us. So that didn't satisfy, and these moments of uh, flow uh, was very rare in those days, producing a lot of unhappiness. But mm. then somehow I found my way back, and uh, I'm very happy to say that now these days, in contrast, um, are much more full of these um, very uh, happy and holistic moments of creative flow. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, you tell the story of being at a conference in 1973 and having an awakening, a moment of revelation where you asked, why do I live this way? What yes. did you mean by that? Well, um, that's, that's exactly the words that came to my mind. I thought that was totally unexpected. Uh, why do I live this way? Because, um, you know, up till then, I was more or less accepting that this is my lot and I uh, have to do what I do and because I don't know anything better to do. And uh, that uh, evening, that, uh, those words came with such force. Mm -hmm. uh, why do I live this way? It gave me a prerogative of, of making changes. I, I just realized that make changes are bust. Uh -huh. So, you know, yes. there's no question anymore <laughs> of vacillation anymore. Right. It's interesting because in the film you talk about our old understanding of science as being objective, reductionist, and focused on upward causation. So how would you define the new science? The new science is accepting of the old, but says that that is incomplete view of the world. Because in quantum physics, this upward causation only produce, uh, produces possibilities, mm -hmm. not actual experiences that is our um, that is what we experience, the actuality. So how does possibility become actuality? This is the big question of quantum physics because quantum mathematics makes it very clear that material interactions cannot ever change possibility into actuality. They always transform possibility into more possibilities. Mm -hmm. So since there is no material solution, our looking at possibility objects, all objects, must consist of something that is not material interaction. So this is where quantum physics clarifies that there is 
a downward causation mm. whose origin is not matter, whose origin is consciousness. Consciousness in a very non-ordinary state of interconnected non-locality in which there is no signal. Right, non-local. That's fascinating because I now hear the buzzword of downward causation. Yes, that is a very important phrase for the New Age. Yes. Now, apart from the gross material body, you talk about the subtle body, in fact, a subtle world consisting of subtle objects. Can you expand yes. on this for our listeners? This is important for them to understand, I think. Well, um, these uh, subtle bodies have been uh, proposed by spiritual traditions for a long time. And, of course, the subtle bodies uh, is part of our experiences. Anybody can look inside and uh, see that we do thinking, we have uh, experiences of feeling, and, of course, uh, very rarefied, but nevertheless, everybody has the experience of even intuiting. So where do these experiences come from? Materialists maintain that everything is brain phenomenon. Mm. But uh, that is very dubious in view of new, science, new scientific results that has um, come now, which is that, for example, mind processes meaning, and meaning cannot be processed by a computer. A computer cannot compute meaning. Mm. So uh, it shows clearly that there is a room for mind. Mind must exist in order to have uh, meaningful experiences, and we do have that. So in this way, if we say that all our experiences, uh, sensing, feeling, meaning, and intuition, all are real, all are legitimate, then we have to postulate uh, three more worlds within uh, the primacy of consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of all being, all possibilities, mm -hmm. but the possibilities must have four compartments, four different worlds. One world we sense, that's the materialist world, mm -hmm. but then one world we feel, that's the vital world. One world we think, that's the world of meaning, the mind. And world, one world is so subtle that we can only intuit it, and that's the world of the archetypes, which I also call supramental, beyond the mind. Thank you. This is interesting. Many neurophysiologists say there is a spot in the midbrain, you were talking about that in your film, that if they excite that spot, it is possible to get an experience of God. What do you think of that experiment? It's really... <laughs> it, it is great. It is great. I mean, I, you know, there's no need to denigrate it, mm -hmm. except that there is no need to get too excited because obviously God is not just an experience. Mm -hmm. An experience is an experience of um, something that has happened before. So somehow we have a spot in the brain. If we excite it, we get the memory of uh, spiritual experiences that happened before, collective memory of these uh, God experiences or spiritual experiences that were created because our ancestors that lived long ago, they participated in these rituals so strongly with such non-locality, now I'm guessing, but it's a good theory, mm -hmm. that uh, their um, morphogenetic fields, these are fields that to partial for theorized, um, uh, which are non-local, they changed, and this changed morphogenetic field is what we have now inherited. So the way the brain is made for us uh, already is wired to uh, behave this way. In other words, if yeah. we still partake in ritual, this memory comes back to us because there is a brain circuit uh, that, that gives back that memory. I see, so our brains have been hardwired from... Yes, the oh. brain is hardwired okay. that way. And, and, and that is the, um, that is, if we accept that explanation, then, uh, then we can go further with it. We can, for example, ask what uh, prevents us making such brain circuits today. Yes, I believe meditation and these altered states of consciousness actually activate this again in us. Um, the, this can activate only the already existing brain circuits, but if we then creatively um, create new experiences of spirituality, mm. then we can make those experiences too um, uh, in a, inheritable by making very strong uh, impressions in the morphogenetic fields, new modifications that then will become perpetuated inherit it in the future generations. If we have been able to do it once, we can do it again. Yes, of course. Absolutely. 
Now, we're talking about non-local consciousness. I believe that an experiment was done in a Faraday cage to show this, to prove yes. this. Can you tell us about the experiment? Yes, this was the experiment of um, Jacobo Greenberg, a neurophysiologist at the University of Mexico, uh, done in 1993 94 and what happens is that um, when Hakobo saw my paper suggesting that you know, there is non-local consciousness from which conscious choice uh, acts as a downward causal force that uh, makes the actualities manifest from quantum possibility, mm. he had an idea that, well, if consciousness is non-local, then if two people meditate, maybe they will uh, tap onto this non-local consciousness and be able to communicate non-locally, so much so that um, even their brain waves should reflect this. Mm. So what he did was so smart. Um, he let two people meditate together for 20 minutes, and uh, then these people are separated. They are taken to Faraday cages, which are electromagnetically impervious, so nobody can say that their communication happened through electromagnetic interactions. Yeah. Um, and then these isolated people, are uh, their brains are connected to electroencephalogram machines to measure their brain waves. And one um, subject is shown a series of light flashes producing uh, electrical activity in the occipital area of the brain. Mm. So this is very nice. Um, and a, a, a uh, electric potential called the evoked potential can be extracted from the brain waves by eliminating the noise. But the surprise of the experiment was that the other subject who is connected to the first subject through meditation about non-local communication between them. That's what they're meditating upon. Mm. This subject has not seen the light flashes. He or she is only meditating on that non-local communication with the first subject. And yet, when...